Welcome to Making a Murderer, Rubber Ducky YouTube channel. You can tell yourself and all our friends I was wrong and you were right. But your sins that happened in the dark will come out in the light. I'm not gonna waste my breath. I won't put up a fight. Cause the days are gonna whisper. And the months are gonna talk. Until the years yell out the truth. Time will tell, time will tell on you. When a train whistles far away and when the cold wind blows, when the lightning in your eyes reveals the darkness in your soul The world will be reminded of what it already knows Cause the days are gonna whisper And the months are gonna talk Until the gears yell out the truth Time will tell, time will tell on you. The most important evidence in this case, in my opinion, is the bloody handprint on the back of the rear cargo door of the RAV. You have to use the handle to open the rear cargo door to put the victim in where the bloody hairprint was found. So who left the big bloody handprint on the exterior cargo door handle? Stephen was excluded by DNA results. We'd like to send that little message to Governor Evers. Why Denny? The Denny Law was used to target Stephen Avery. The fact that the detectives did not investigate other suspects eliminated the possibility of providing motives and evidence that would point to another suspect. This is how Stephen Avery was targeted. If the defense team were able to just start listing other people with potential to have committed the crime with absolutely no evidence linking or pointing to that person, it would be a farce. It would be confusing to the jury to hear any theory the defense would present relating to how someone else may have done it. So courts decided if you're going to point the finger at someone in front of the jury, you need to have a good reason for doing so. If you legitimately have a good reason for thinking a specific other person committed the crime, you need to share with prosecution so they can investigate. If you don't have a good reason, to legitimately suspect someone else, you can't tell the jury about that person. This rule is unique to the state of Wisconsin and stems from a 1984 Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling in the case of State v. Denny. In this case, in the Stephen Avery case, the Denny Law would have been applied anyway unless you could provide a motive. Under Denny, a defendant is required to demonstrate a legitimate tendency test in order to suggest third-party liability. The defendant must show motive, opportunity, and some evidence to directly connect the third person to the crime. Motive, by definition, is a noun, reason for doing something, especially one that is hidden or not obvious. The second is opportunity, definition, noun, a set of circumstances that makes it possible to do something. And the third criteria, evidence, definition, noun, 
the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or position is true or valid. But in this case, in Stevens' case, there was misguided legal counsel. The state of Wisconsin had charged Stephen Avery acknowledging lack of motive. Stephen felt since the state could charge him without a motive established, he would not provide a motive for any of those he named as third-party suspects. The defense was well aware of the law requiring all three criteria to be met in order to point the finger at the third-party suspects. Feuding and Strain knew not providing motive for the suggested other suspects was in fact securing the court's rejection of any other suspect being named other than their client for the jury. It was a decision made knowing the outcome would not be fair to their client, Stephen Avery. Let me ask you this. Why would the defense not have explained this to Stephen when they knew the expected outcome would result in Stephen being the only suspect that would be considered by the jury? Eight prints were found in and outside of the vehicle that the, was established to be Teresa Hobox. Wisconsin State Crime Lab Mike Riddle testified about the recovery of eight useful latent fingerprints from Halbox turquoise colored Toyota RAV4. Avery was arrested on November 9, 2005. All of the fingerprint evidence that was identified from the RAV4 was compared against the fingerprints and palm prints of Avery. I think a total of eight locations, Riddle testified at trial, and those eight were eight latent prints. Fingerprint evidence came from multiple Aquafina bottles in the front of the RAV4, a black plastic CD case, a discarded granola bar wrapper in the back cargo area. More prints were located in the rear of the vehicle, including near the taillight. A palm print was also discovered. Inside, more fingerprints were found on an inside front passenger window and a back passenger window. Also, a fingerprint was lifted off the victim's hood. If anybody would open a hood, might touch it and leave a fingerprint? Asked Avery's lawyer, Jerry Buting, during the trial. That's correct, Riddle testified. Initially, Riddle testified, Special Prosecutors Tom Fallon and King Kratz asked him to compare the slew of recoverable fingerprints and palm prints to Avery, their murdered defendant. And they did not match, correct? Asked Avery's lawyer, Jerry Buting. No, they did not. That's correct, Riddle agreed. Riddle also testified that prosecutors only asked him to compare the unknown prints to mostly members of Avery's extended family, including Avery's parents, his brothers Chuck and Earl, and Avery's nephew, the Dassey brothers. None of the other fingerprints matched them. But am I correct that you did not and have not, as of today, ever compared fingerprint standards with Lieutenant James Link or Sergeant Andrew Colborn to any of those fingerprints from the RAV4? Buting followed up. I did not. You are correct, Riddle testified. So, the big question comes. We have an obvious bloody handprint on the back of the rear cargo door. You can't open that unless you grab the latch. And inside was placed the victim with her bloody hairprint. This is Sherry Culhane, Brendan Dassey's trial. She's a lab tech manager for the state crime lab. She's questioned. Question, and do you recall whether there were swabs of the cargo door handle? Answer, the back, the very back, there was a, I did take a, a swab of, um, and I believe it was my item A23 because um, I did analysis was processing that area and saw something. I did swab that area and I did extract it. Question. Okay. You did extract a sample? Answer. Yes. She claimed to get 
an incomplete answer, an incomplete profile. But here's the biggest question. Why not simply re-swab the sample as there's plenty of DNA in the bloody handprint on the cargo door handle when the suspect charged has been excluded? It would have changed the way the jury judged the case. Look at these handprints. You can clearly see there's blood. Whose blood is it? Who has an alibi? Is it Bobby Dassey? No. Ryan Hillegas? No reported alibi. Scott Tadich said he was at the hospital visiting his mother. That's a lie. Mike O? Mike Osmondson? Nobody asked. What about his brother, Earl? No alibi. What about his friend, Robert Fabian? Never asked. What about Scott Blodorn? None on record. How about Chuck Avery? No alibi. What about Andrean Andreas Martinez? None on record. What about Blaine? Why was he the only Avery that was left out, or the only Dassey, I should say, left out of DNA elimination? You have to ask, who is the real suspect? because the handprint did not belong to Mr. Stephen Avery. Now let's look at each one. Let's start with Scott. Let's think about this. In 2002, Scott Tadich was charged for assaulting a woman and her 11-year-old son he was a no-call, no-show at work that night. His only alibi is that of Bobby Dassey, who alibi each other. His co-worker reported Scott had approached him to sell a twenty-two rifle that belonged to one of the Dassey boys. Another co-worker reported Scott frantically left work after receiving a phone call regarding bloody clothes mixed in with his. Scott refuses to submit his DNA for exclusion as a suspect to Mrs. Zellner, and an eyewitness puts him at the Dassey residence around noon. Motive, hired gun, hatred toward suspect, framing of suspect, history of violence towards females. Opportunity, eyewitness reported seeing Scott's vehicle at the property just two hours prior to the victim's disappearance. Scott also had knowledge the victim was coming to the property that day. He has no alibi. Evidence. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. His DNA was never excluded. Let's look at Bobby Dassey, Steve Avery's nephew. Bobby Dassey has no alibi except for Scott Tadich, whose vehicle was seen by an eyewitness at the Dassey property the day of the victim's disappearance. He was two hours late for work that night. Bobby was quoted as saying, Stephen would stab you in the back. Bobby was the only other person than Stephen to see the victim last. He had multiple scratches on his back and his computer was seized and produced evidence of an obsession of depraved-minded searches involving death and dismemberment. Motive, rejection, anger, jealousy, depraved mind. Opportunity, he places himself on the property at the time of the victim arrives. He left immediately after the suspect reports the victim left the property, placing him following the victim as she leaves the property. He has no alibi. Evidence, Bobby's internet searches revealed a depraved mind interest and had fly, files named of the victim and suspect on his computer. Let's look at Mike Osmondson. This is Bobby Dassey's very best friend. Mike Osmondson had dated Marie Avery, who had a prior relationship with Stephen. Marie expressed that Mike Osmondson hated Stephen. Mike alleges Stephen joked about 
quote, hiding the body on November 10th. However, Stephen was arrested on November 9th. Mike stated that the only other time he was on the property was October 31st. Mike has a partial alibi for a few hours that evening, alleging he took his younger brother trick-or-treating, but law enforcement failed to verify, leaving suspicion. Motive, jealousy, anger, hatred, a suspect. Opportunity. Mike has no alibi for the time leading up to 6 p.m. and no alibi for after 8 p.m. He placed himself on the property on the day the victim disappears. He was aware the van was being sold. Mike moved after, out of state after the crime. Evidence? Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle. A bloody handprint on the cargo door handle? His DNA was never excluded. Tom Yonda Who was Tom Yonda? Well, Tom Yonda was moving out of the home of the Dassey boys and was married to the suspect's sister, Barb Yonda, at the time of the victim's disappearance. His cousin, Scott Tadich, was having an affair with his wife, Barb, which caused them to legally separate and later divorce. Barb reported Tom was the closest to her sons than anyone else in her life. Teresa had appointments with Tom prior she had photographed his vehicles for him in the past. Tom was never investigated or asked for an alibi the day the victim disappeared. Motive? Possible intent to frame Scott Tadich in revenge. Help with cover-up to protect his stepson. Opportunity. Tom Yonda was moving out of the residence of the property the victim is reported to have disappeared from. He would have most likely known the van was being photographed and listed with Auto Trader and expected the photographer would have been Teresa Halbach. He has no reported alibi. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle, and his DNA was never excluded. Earl Avery, the suspect's brother. This is Earl. Now, Earl was the youngest of the Avery brothers and was in line to inherit a third of the family salvage yard. The family business suffered dramatically when Stephen was falsely convicted in 1985, leaving his brothers and family to scavenge for business to keep their salvage business alive. In early 2005, Stephen reported his brothers and him had different ideas on how the business should be run. Stephen moved into an eye shack on the property to have his own space. Earl has a criminal history of sexual abuse of females and a record of molesting his own two daughters as children. Earl and his wife, Candy Avery, accused Stephen of raping his adopted daughter, Marie Avery, in 2004. Earl stayed behind and gave permission for the searches on November 5th, the day the RAV4 is found. Earl volunteered to the police that he thought Stephen was guilty. Motive? Sibling rivalry. Record of sexual assault charges? Jealousy. Revenge. Possible monetary gain. Opportunity? Earl knew the victim was coming to the property. Earl wanted Teresa to come to the quarry for a hustle shot of the front loader, which he was reported by three witnesses to be driving at the time the victim disappeared. He has no alibi. Evidence? Cadaver dogs hit on the golf cart he reported. He was driving past the location the victim's vehicle was later found. He was using the same type of gun the victim was allegedly shot with to hunt on the same property the victim disappeared from. He had pulled up several small trees which were used to hide the victim's vehicle. He hid under dirty laundry when the law enforcement came to collect his DNA. How about Charles Avery, Stephen's older brother? Now Charles, Charles Avery sexually assaulted his ex-wife in 1999. She reported he tried to strangle her with a phone cord while raping her. Salvage Yard females customers reported Chucky for stalking them in their personal lives.
Charles and his brother Earl Avery expected the victim to do a hustle shot down on the front loader in the quarry where the pelvic bones are found after Teresa leaves Stephen's home. Chucky reported that Earl was in the quarry at the time the victim disappeared, driving the front loader. Stephen had told the reporters that he and his brothers were having trouble seeing eye to eye on how the salvage yard business should be run. A regular customer reported that he found the Avery Salvage office abandoned when he showed up for service, which had never happened before. He also reported that Charles Avery finally returned to the office and seemed out of breath and suspicious. This would have been the time frame of the victim's disappearance. Motive? Sibling rivalry. Sexual depraved mind? Jealousy? Revenge? Possible monetary gain? Opportunity. Chucky knew the victim was coming to the property. He had told Stephen to send the auto trader gal down to photograph the front loader. Chucky was not at the office when the customer arrived, which was approximate time the victim allegedly disappeared. The victim would have needed to pass the main office to exit the property. He has no alibi. Evidence? Cadaver dogs hit on his dirty laundry and the law enforcement removed what appeared to be blood-stained sheets and a bloody stained pillow, as well as samples of blood-like stains from his couch. They took two police badges and a handgun in his office desk, along with multiple guns in the office building. His vehicle parked in front of the salvage office had guns stored in the back seat and trunk. Now, let's look at Robert Fabian. This is Robert. He was Earl and Candy Avery's brother-in-law and Earl's best friend. He had lived on the property in years past and knew the property well. Robert reported he was on the property hunting rabbits with Earl Avery with a 22 gun, the same type as the victim alleged, allegedly disappears. Earl reported that Robert was with him when they drove the golf cart that the cadaver dog hit on by the location that the victim's vehicle was later found. He reported he saw the RAV4 located on the turnabout on State Highway 147. He was aware that Chuck and Earl were expecting the auto trader girl to do a hustle shot for the front loader. He was never investigated or considered a person of interest. Motive? Possible cover-up in helping his best friend, Earl Avery, or a simple hunting accident. Opportunity. Robert Fabian reported that he was hunting on the property at the time the victim disappears. He inquires with Chuck Avery if the auto trader gal had been there yet, proving he was expecting her to arrive. He has no alibi. Evidence. Cadaver dogs hit on the golf cart that Robert and Earl drove while hunting the night the victim is thought to have gone missing. They are both using a twenty two rifle, which was the alleged murder weapon. He reports having knowledge where the victim's vehicle was before law enforcement or others. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. His DNA was never excluded. What about Ryan Hillegas? This is Ryan. Ryan was the victim's ex-boyfriend who remained in her life and in her death as a large focus. He obtained the day planner from the victim, which he had in her possession hours before her disappearance. He suffered deep scratches on his hands that left scars in the trial photos. He helped police collect the intimate personal effects of the victim for DNA purposes, including her underwear. He led the search party, giving them maps directing where they should search, and personally assisted the victim's cousin with supplies and direction in locating the victim's car. During trial, when questioned, he could not remember if it was night or day when he saw the victim last, just the day before she was reported missing. His phone records reflect large gaps of phone silence during key time frames of the days following her disappearance. He reported in trial that he guesses the victim's password to her computer and was able to access 
her phone records. He lied to law enforcement reporting the victim damaged her car prior to her disappearance, made a claim, and didn't repair the damage. Later, post-conviction defense verified the insurance company denied a claim was ever made. Motive? Jealousy, rejection, rage, revenge for sleeping with his best friend, Scott Blodorn. Opportunity. Ryan could not remember if he saw the victim at night or if it was daytime. He reported to the New York newspaper prior to trial that he had seen the victim wearing a cowgirl outfit the last time he saw her alive. He was best friends with the victim's roommate and has easy access to her home and personal belongings as well as regular contact with her. He moved in the victim's home during the investigation. Ryan has no alibi. Evidence? He provided the law enforcement with the victim's handwritten day planner, which she had in her possession hours before her disappearance. He had multiple deep scratches on the back of his hands. The victim's boss, Tom Pierce, reported that Ryan had been verbally and phys physically abusive to the victim when they dated for five years. He supplied a map to the victim's relative, who shortly after located the victim's car. Ryan intentionally misled investigators and law enforcement regarding the victim's damage to her car. His phone records show zero activity for six hours during the day the victim disappears. Ryan also gained access to the victim's phone, phone account and knew her username and password. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the car guard, cargo door handle. His DNA was never excluded. Scott Blodorn. Scott Blodorn was the victim's ex-lover and roommate at the time of her disappearance. He helped lead the search party and assist the victim's relative in locating the victim's car. He had access to all the victim's personal effects. He reported that she never slept away from home overnight. However, he knew she had not been home for several nights and failed to report her missing, including when she didn't make contact on his birthday. His best friend is the victim's ex-boyfriend, Brian Hillegas, and yet Scott had sexual relationship with her. He is not considered a suspect, nor is he investigated by law enforcement. Motive? Jealousy, rejection, rage, possible assist in the cover-up for best friend, Ryan Hillegas. Opportunity. Scott was the only one that lived with the victim at the time of her disappearance. He had access to her personal effects, including her computer and work schedules. He was the last known person to see her alive at her home, hours before her disappearance. Scott is a relative of Sheriff Pogel. Scott has no alibi. Evidence? An email from the victim to the close friend revealed that Teresa thought it was a mistake to sleep with Scott, her roommate, calling him a slob. He arranged to provide a camera to the victim's relative who found the victim's vehicle. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. His DNA, of course, was never excluded. Mike Halbach. Mike Halbach was the victim's brother. He also became the family spokesperson. Mike Halbach reported it would be, quote, a real mess if someone found his sister alive during a news interview while searching for his sister. He testified during trial that he had accessed the victim's phone messages while she was missing. Later, it was determined that phone messages had been deleted from her voicemail. During the interview by the local news crew, Mike expressed the grieving process might only take a few days or longer and showed few signs of emotions during the press releases to follow. His sister was only reported missing at the time of the interview. He is not considered a suspect, nor was he investigated. Motive, sibling, rivalry, jealousy, rage, possible monetary gain, possible assist, and cover-up. 
opportunity, Mike would have access to details of her whereabouts due to the knowledge of her online accounts, phone messages, and schedules. He has no reported alibi. Evidence? Mike referred to the victim in past tense multiple times, including referring to grieving prior to knowledge by law enforcement of her death. He also stated it would be a real mess when asked what happened if she was found alive. During trial, he admitted to having access to the victim's phone messages, but denied being the one to delete the message, missing messages. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle, and Mike Halbach's DNA was never excluded. Josh Randa Josh Randa owned property that neighbored Avery Salvage Yard and the bone evidence was found at Randon's deer camp. Josh reported that at 4.30 p.m. on October 31, 2005, he was present at the quarry where the pelvic bone is found later. During the investigation, the day the RAV4 is found, November 5th, Josh visits the Avery property according to the sign-in and out logs. His family files bankruptcy after the victim's disappearance, but then turns around and buys multiple lots of land surrounding the Avery property. Josh hired Stephen to burn brush for him and then turns around and reports Stephen had a fire. The cadaver dog hits on the back porch of Josh's family deer camp. The cadaver dog leads the handler to Cuss Road from deer camp. Cuss Road is a crime scene taped off and of high interest and activity. Sheriff Pogo refused to allow the cadaver dog to do his job and access the Cuss Road because he explained it was a crime scene. Motive, hired gun, monetary gain. Opportunity, Josh himself reported that he was at the Randick Quarry at 4.30 p.m. the night the victim went missing. He owns the deer camp where the cadaver dog hit. He has easy access to Cuss Road, which was a crime scene taped off and a huge interest to all investigators. Of course, he was never asked for an alibi. Evidence. During the investigation, Josh worked at the quarry where the cadaver dog hit on the front loader, the conveyor, and later the human pelvic bone was found. Cadaver dog also hit on the back step of the little red trailer at his deer camp. Bones were collected into evidence from his deer camp burn barrel. Other murdered vi victims have been found at the Randick Quarry in the past. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle, and Josh Randon's DNA was never excluded. Now let's talk about zippers and their dog. This is Joellen Zipper. Now, Joelle and Zipper never witnessed the victim leaving their property. George Zipper was drunk and belligerent, accusing the auto trader girl of trespassing. George threatened the law enforcement that if anyone came on his property, his dog would eat them, starting with the toes. His grandson, Jason Zipper, later, later committed suicide in 2017. George burned down his garage within months of the disappearance of the victim and built a new garage in place. Motive? Accidental shooting of trespasser. Family dog attacking and killing victim. Opportunity. George actually had very little opportunity as he was verified to be at work at the time the victim went missing and his grandson Jason also had little to no opportunity as he was confirmed to be in school all day, leaving the family dog to protect the property with both male owners away. Evidence. George threatened that his dog would eat any trespassers on his property. He was belligerent drunk and lied to the police several times. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle, George nor Jason's DNA was ever excluded. Let's look at Tom Pierce. Now, this was the victim's partner, more or less her boss, and Tom Pierce operated and shared a photography studio with the victim in Green Bay where both Tom and Teresa were doing nude photography as a sideline business. Tom was the one that reported the victim missing.
He reported the victim had told him that Halloween would be her last day working for Auto Trader. He also reported the victim was receiving random calls from an unknown number. He expressed concern for her safety and referred to the victim past tense while she was only missing as noted by investigators. Motive, jealousy, rejection, and rage. Opportunity. Tom stated that he and the victim reported to each other regarding their appointments and schedules. Tom, of course, no alibi. Evidence, Tom was the first reporter missing. He spoke in the past tense when referring to the victim before she was reported as a homicide. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle. A bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. His DNA, never excluded. So now, as if we don't have enough people to consider, turns out Teresa, the victim, was having an affair with Mr. Bradley Shack. Bradley was a married man that had an affair with the victim that resulted in a restraining order from his wife, followed five days later, her filing for divorce. The victim was hired to phot photograph Bradley and his wife, Casey, in the nude. Later, the photographs would be the subject in a court of law. Bradley and his wife's nude photographs and negatives were found in a trunk by the victim's bed. He remained in contact and had called her the day she was last seen. Teresa told a friend that she was no longer interested in Bradley because, quote, he was weird. And in the last months before her disappearance, Teresa also had told her friend she was not accepting Bradley's phone calls any longer. Motive, jealousy, rejection, rage, and revenge. Opportunity. Bradley lived within 10 miles of the property of the victim was last seen on. He worked from 1 a.m. to 10 a.m. on the day of her disappearance, leaving him available and without an alibi. Evidence. Shaq had a restraining order from his wife implying she feared him. The victim played a major role in his divorce. His and his wife's nude photographs and negatives were found in the trunk by the victim's bed. He phoned the victim prior to her going missing. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door, and his DNA never excluded. Now let's talk about Andreas Martinez. This is Andreas. Now, Andreas Martinez was a regular customer of Avery Salvage Yard and was reported being at the salvage yard on the day the victim's car is allegedly found. He attacked his wife with an axe, striking, striking her in the head, almost killing her, when he returned from the salvage yard that day. He approached Barb Tadich in prison when she was visiting Brendan, and he told her that he knew factually Brendan was innocent. Motive, rage, depraved mind, and also homicidal tendencies. Opportunity. Andreas was a regular customer and reported being on the property the day the victim's car was allegedly found. He has no reported alibi. Evidence. Andreas was mentally unstable at the time of the victim's disappearance and had been charged with battery just weeks before October 20th. Andreas then attacked his wife with an axe and almost killed her with a blow to the head. The missing victim's bones were later found dismembered. He volunteered to take the, quote, rap for Teresa's murder. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. His DNA, of course, was never excluded. Now, maybe you have heard of this gentleman. Maybe you haven't. Richard, well, let's start off. Roger Richard Raymond Randews. You got it. Roger Randews reported a man, reported to a man named Bruchart that inmates had broken in the prison lab and stolen a vial of Steve Avery's blood before Roger was released from the prison that Stephen Avery was in. Roger claimed he had come across Teresa, who had run out of gas on the side of State Highway 147. Roger said he tried to have sex with her, and she refused, so he killed her. After allegedly killing the victim, 
Roger claimed to have planted Stephen's blood from the prison file into the victim's car and then planted the RAV4 on the Avery salvage yard. Richard died in 2007. Motive, rage, depraved mind, revenge, hatred, envy, history of committing multiple homicides. Opportunity, Roger claimed that he had been he had befriended a Dassey boy and would watch Stephen at the salvage yard without being seen. He claimed the victim had run out of gas on the side of the road he was driving on. Roger was not in custody at the time of the victim's disappearance and he had no reported alibi. Evidence? Roger confessed to Bruchart that he had murdered the victim on State Highway 147, which was where multiple eyewitnesses reported seeing the victim's vehicle. He reportedly drove a white van. The victim was reportedly seen days later by two separate eyewitnesses in a white van. Roger has a criminal history of violence of stabbing his victims. Brendan Dassey reported that Teresa Halbach was stabbed in the stomach. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. His DNA, of course, was never excluded. The German guy. Hmm. This is a mystery. But, as the mystery goes, it really did occur. A man, by the last name of German, whose wife was moving, went to a new home where she found fresh bones on the property. She came home to a second-story balcony window open. After that, she located an open closet at the base of the stairs where she found a woman's pair of jeans, a top, a pillowcase with red stains, and a pair of yellow panties. His wife also reported that when the news reported that the victim was missing, that her husband stated that the girl was dead already. His wife reported all of it to Manitowoc Sheriff's Officer, but was informed they already recovered the victim's clothing. She continued to find more suspicious items as time went on and eventually left her husband and fled to another state. Motive, depraved mind, history of mental illness, opportunity. The German guy's wife reported that he had spoken of being at a salvage yard at the time of the victim's disappearance. He has no reported alibi. Evidence, the German guy stated the victim was already dead when she was only missing. His wife found woman's clothes and fresh bones on her property. She also found yellow panties with blood-like stains in them. When the wife told him she was going to report him, the German guy laughed at her and told her no one would believe her. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle. A bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. His DNA was, of course, never excluded. Now, let's talk about Sean Rudy. This is a picture of Sean Rudy. Sean Rudy shot his six-month pregnant wife in the face on November 12, 2005 on a deserted dirt road in the middle of the forest only nine days after Teresa was reported missing. He wrapped his wife's body in a tarp with the help of a lover and they loaded her body into the back seat of his car. He dismembered the body in his mother's tiny garage near her trailer home and then tried to burn her remains in the pit behind the small garage using a burning barrel for her belongings. His lover watched as he completed all of this. He and his lover then loaded the remains of the partially burned body into a can and disposed of it over the Coban Bridge into the Chippewa River. He had been on a crime spree for at least a week prior stealing guns and other valuables while high on meth. Sean confessed to his mother and friend that he had also robbed over 25 taverns on his trip and then later confessed he had killed Christine, his wife, as well. He pled no contest and there was no jury trial. He's serving two life sentences for his wife and their unborn child's murder plus 25 or more years for additional crimes. Motive? Depraved mind, high on meth, hatred, 
Sean reported he did it because he didn't want a disabled child due to the expected mother's drug use of meth while pregnant. Opportunity. He was on the move and had traveled even out of state. He was high on meth and has he was armed with intent to do harm. He shot his wife only 13 days after the victim disappears. And of course, he has no reported alibi. Evidence. Both victims died by alleged gunshots to the head. His wife and the victim both have cut marks on their dismembered bones. Both victim remains were burned. Each victim's remains were spread out over a large distance. Sean confessed he was hoping someone would find his wife's body to give her a proper burial. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle, and Sean Rudy's DNA was never excluded. Let's talk about law enforcement. Andrew Colburn. Now, Andrew Colburn worked for Manitowoc County in 1995 when he received a call from a Brown County detective that confirmed an inmate by the name of Gregory Allen had confessed to a sexual assault crime that another inmate was wrongly serving time for. Andrew and his supervisors did not investigate the claim resulting in Stephen Avery serving an additional nine years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. Deputy Colburn had just completed his deposition in the civil suit against Manitoba County for $36 million when he volunteered to be the first to question Stephen Avery in the Hawbach disappearance. Many pieces of evidence were discovered by Colburn or his partner, Lieutenant Link, including the suspicious key found laying under a pair of slippers after Colburn reportedly shook the cabinet violently. Mr. Andrew Colburn was running for sheriff in the upcoming election at the time of the disappearance of the victim. Motive. Frame suspect to restore his credibility. Political game by playing a hero. Retain pensions and save the county from bankruptcy. Or just simply following orders. Opportunity. Andrew Colburn frequented the salvage yard and was friends with Earl Avery. As a police officer, he would have had the opportunity to pull a driver over. He had no reported alibi. Evidence. Sergeant Colborn has an invested interest in the outcome of the suspect, Stephen Avery, to be found guilty. He also calls in the victim's vehicle plates, make in year two days prior to the RAV being found by the victim's relative. He uses his cell phone and calls the Spanish line to reach dispatch. Reports reflect the victim's vehicle is seized on the same day. However, the vehicle was not reportedly found until two days later. Sergeant Colburn is reportedly, quote, concentrating on the cabinet, which two days later the alleged victim's single valet key falls from, landing underneath a pair of slippers. Defense required collection of Link's fingerprints, but never used them to compare to evidence. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle, and his DNA was never excluded. His partner, James Link. Let's talk about Link. Detective Link had been disposed just a week before the victim was reported missing in the $36 million civil lawsuit filed by the suspect. Stephen Avery. He found the alleged victim's single valet key, which tested positive for the suspect's DNA, but was said void of the victim's DNA. The suspect's DNA on the key was comparable to a buccal swab of rich saliva DNA rather than the touch DNA reported by the state. He was present when they found the small bullet fragments in the Avery garage months later after many completed searches. When post-conviction experts examined the fragments, they were able to determine there was a complete lack of victim bone and blood DNA on the bullet, excluding, excluding it as a murder weapon. He was present when the missing license plates were found in the old salvaged station wagon, and he had access to the suspect's blood and other evidence from the 1985 DNA collection rape kits 
and blood draws. Motive? Frame suspect to restore his credibility, retain pensions, and save the county from bankruptcy, or just simply following orders. Opportunity. As a police officer, he would have had the opportunity to pull a driver over. Detective Link has access to all the biological evidence from the 1985 case, as well as helped find much of the evidence in the 2005 case. He, of course, has no reported alibi. Evidence. Detective Link has an invested interest of the outcome of the suspect Stephen Avery to be guilty. James Link has access to the suspect's home many times during the investigation. He was present when most evidence was found. He admitted he was aware of the conflict of interest, however, assured the county lawyer that he would do his job professionally. He is present when the key that has no victim DNA is found suspiciously under a slipper after falling from a cabinet. His partner shakes. Defense required collection of Link's fingerprints, but never used them to compare to evidence. Eight unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle, a bloody handprint on the cargo door handle, and James Link's DNA was never excluded. Now, let's talk about the $36 million motive. Look at all these individuals. In the middle, we have Peterson. He was the sheriff. Well, he was the undersheriff at the time The Stephen Avery was arrested in 1985. Then to his left, we have Tom Kasurik. And to his left, Gene Kush. And to his left, Robert Herman. Now, if you look over Peterson's shoulder, that's Mark Rohr, the DA. Then Judy Dvorak, Dennis Vogel, James Link, and Andrew Colborn. Now, you think that's a lot of people, but guess what? 36 people were dispo deposed regarding the $36 million lawsuit. $36 million lawsuit and 36 people. Hmm. Don't you wonder who they all were? These nine individuals framed Stephen Avery for attempted murder and sexual assault in 1985. They knew he was much shorter than the victim Penny Bernstein identified, as well as had blue eyes when she clearly stated her assailant had brown eyes. She also stated her attacker wore underwear, which Stephen Avery did not own. They did not investigate in other leads than Stephen, and they chose to place him in both lineups in 1985. In 1999, when Brown County Detective informed them, Gregory Allen had admitted to committing the crime that Stephen was serving time for. They suppressed the information, even though the DA Vogel had just prosecuted Gregory in a sexual assault case in the recent past. Jean Couchet, the chief detective for Manitowoc, argued during the depositions that he believed DNA evidence could be tampered with, and he express, expressed he did not trust the results from the state crime lab that exonerated Stephen Avery. Motive, frame suspect to restore credibility, political gain, retention of pensions, and save the county from bankruptcy. Following orders, hatred for the suspect, conflict of interest, and none other than $36 million. Opportunity. The state crime lab manager, Sherry Colhane, delayed releasing the results clearing Stephen Avery for one year, providing opportunity to plan how to stop the impending civil lawsuit by the defendant. They also had access to evidence, as it was found by the Manitowoc County officers, and an ongoing relationship with Ms. Colhane from her misidentification of a single hair that led to Stephen Avery's wrongful conviction in the 1985 case. None of these people have reported alibis. The evidence. The victim told her boss, Tom Pierce, her last day of work for Auto Trader would be Halloween night. How did she know that? She transferred her assets to her brother weeks before she went missing. She was only 25. Why would she transfer assets? They knowingly imprisoned the innocent suspect for 18 years. Their own chief detective, Jean Couch, or Couchet, suggested he knew the DNA evidence could be 
manipulated, and didn't trust our own state crime lab results. 8. Unidentified prints on the victim's vehicle. A bloody handprint on the cargo door handle. None of their DNA was ever excluded. Stephen was charged with murder. Calumet County Special Prosecutor Ken Kratz charged Stephen Avery with first degree intentional homicide, mutilation of a corpse, and possession of firearms by a felon. I have a question. Why didn't the defense show what we have in this presentation? If armchair detectives can clearly establish a motive for over 20 suspects, why didn't the overpaid, high-profile lawyers do their job? Ineffectual counseling is an understatement. Stephen had no motive to harm the victim, but over 20 others did. Time will tell. Time will tell. No one may ever say a thing, but surely as the seasons change, you feel like every finger points at you cause you're to blame. And the days are gonna whisper, and the months are gonna talk, until the years shall out the truth. Tell on you.